So 
The Lord is my strength and my might. The Lord has become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, you are our God and we give you thanks. We extol you for you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. In death and in life, beyond the grave and into new creation, your steadfast love endures. To you we sing glad songs of victory for you have become our salvation. Your works are marvelous in our eyes. Let no shadow of the grave terrify us and no fear of darkness turn our hearts from you. Reveal yourself to us this day and all our days as the first and the last, the living one, our immortal Savior and Lord. Amen. God has exalted Jesus at his right hand as leader and savior, so that he might give to us redemption and forgiveness of sins. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together. Eternal God, take from us that sin by which we declare we have no sin. Make us sorry for all the ways we have wounded one another. Keep us penitent for our neglect of the world's suffering. For the sick we have not visited, for the hungry we have not fed, for the naked we have not clothed, for the prisoners we have not set free. Especially deepen our sadness for not having loved you with our whole heart and mind and soul and strength. Have mercy on us, we pray, and give us again such trust in your victory over sin and death that we shall dare to touch that which we have not believed, to heal the wounds, to require justice, and to hold fast to the practices of compassion through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished upon us. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven.
In the name of Christ, we welcome you to worship this morning at Shadyside Presbyterian Church. Whether you are worshiping with us here in person or joining us remotely, we are glad that we are together bound in the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please take a moment and be sure to sign the pew pads, either here in person or virtually, and let us know that you are here. A special welcome to the Chamber Choir from Pensbury High School in Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania, who are offering music in our service today. And they will also be presenting a free informal concert from 1230 till 1. We hope that you'll join us for a time of fellowship outside in the Fisher Garden immediately following worship, and then make your way back into the sanctuary for their wonderful program. Also, I am told that if you are looking for your children after worship, you will find them outside as well with our Sunday school leaders and staff. Please be reminded that next Sunday, due to the Pittsburgh Marathon, worship will be rescheduled to 4 o'clock p.m. Please see further details in your bulletin and uh, notice all the events related to that day, and we hope that you will participate as you are able and be sure to join us at 4 o'clock for worship. And I hope that you'll note all the other announcements in the bulletin and on our website about the ways that you can participate in the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ at Shadyside Presbyterian Church. Now, as God's people, we join in hearing God's word, receiving the good news of Christ coming among us and risen to reign in glory. Let us pray. Send your spirit among us, O God, as we hear your word. In your gracious mercy, move our hearts to accept what we hear and mold our wills to follow you in faith and in joy. Through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is Acts 5, verses 27 through 32. Hear the word of the Lord. When the temple police had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior so that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come. 
Our scripture reading comes to us from the Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter beginning with verse 19. But before we hear this word of God for the people of God, a word about anti-Semitism embedded in our scriptures. Of all the gospel accounts in our biblical canon, the gospel of John was written last. It differs significantly from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, likely because of the time elapsed between the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and the time when most scholars believe the Gospel of John reached its final form between 90 and 110 in the Common Era. Thus, this Gospel account reads less like a synopsis of events and more like a systematic theology derived from and overlaid on those events. For the most part, the beauty and the relatability of this particular gospel narrative can be attributed to the intervening years, to the authors having lived with the spirit of the risen Christ for most of his life. After all, we who have not known Jesus of Nazareth can proclaim with the gospel writer that Jesus is indeed the bread of life, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, and the life. That Jesus is the vine and we are the branches resonates with us. We believe this having never seen Jesus in the flesh and so it helps to have within the canon of our Holy Scripture, John's witness, which is in comparison to the other gospel accounts more like our own experience of life with the risen Jesus. But there's also a downside. By the time the gospel according to John reached its final form, the religious and civil authorities who plotted and carried out Jesus' arrest and crucifixion were known simply as the Jews. This shift is unfortunate, for this overgeneralization has formed the basis of much anti-Semitism and violence against Jews, even the Holocaust. And we know that this cannot be the will of God, for our God is a God who keeps covenant, who covenanted with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Sarah and Hagar, and Ruth and Rahab, and with their descendants forever. So if God keeps God's promises, then God's covenant first with Jews and then with Gentiles is not to be slandered. So when we read from the gospel according to John, we do so with biblical scholars who know and proclaim that when we see the Jews in the text, that unfortunate label refers only to the religious and civic authorities who had combined their power in an odd alliance against Jesus. I will read the text as such, so as not to perpetuate the anti-Semitism that must break God's own heart. Hear now the reading, beginning with chapter 20, verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace, be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. 
Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On the day our oldest daughter was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, her nurse said to us, if the ulcers that are on the inside of her body were on the outside, we'd all wonder how she's been making it through the day. It was a Wednesday, and the MRI left no room for doubt. Our oldest daughter's digestive tract was heavily damaged. We would need to change her diet, monitor her inflammatory markers through blood draws, and begin a regimen of steroids and other medicines in an effort to put her Crohn's into remission. Hers was our first appointment of the day. As soon as she had changed out of her hospital gown and back into regular clothes, we descended four floors on a hospital elevator for her younger sister's appointment, a diagnostic test to measure the reflux in her kidneys. The test would determine how successful her latest 11-hour surgery had been, the third major surgery in the fewer than two years since she'd been born. Most people who meet our girls assume they are healthy, but the appearance of health can be deceiving when the wounds are on the inside, invisible to the naked eye. My oldest daughter has been denied the use of the bathroom at school, even though her Crohn's has been well documented and communicated. Her needs are frequently dismissed or minimized. When others cannot see the hurts that are on the inside, it is easy for them to invalidate the pain, the sleepless nights, the seemingly endless doctor visits, the invasive medical tests, the worry. As a mother, I wish I could take all the hurt away, including the hurt caused by the flippant dismissal of very real internal pain. And as a pastor, I wish I could take all the hurt away, especially the very real internal pain in your lives that no one sees. Perhaps the flip side of journeying through this life with my two older daughters and their health challenges is that I am ultra-sensitive to the many varieties of invisible wounds that plague the people of God. Certainly there are physical pains that our eyes alone cannot detect, but debilitating hurt emerges in many forms. Job loss hurts. Depression hurts. Grief hurts. Severed relationships hurt. Scary diagnoses hurt. Dreaded treatments hurt. Dementia hurts. Loss of ability hurts. Loneliness hurts. And this list represents just a slim cross-section of the hurts we might otherwise ignore because they are seldom on display. Just reading the news every day hurts. And even so, we know the paper cuts we receive in the process do not compare to the gaping, blood-gushing, life-threatening, internal bleeding of those who are themselves in the news. When Jesus appears to the disciples who are locked in a room for fear that they too will end up dying on Roman crosses, Thomas isn't among them. And one has to wonder why. Why wasn't Thomas there? This detail makes me think back to the earliest days of this pandemic when 
Someone had to be brave enough to leave the safety of isolation to go to the grocery store. Maybe Thomas, for whatever reason, was least likely to be recognized as one of Jesus' disciples? Or maybe he was simply the most courageous. He gets such a bad rap. Doubting Thomas, we call him as if doubt were his first name, as if doubt were a bad thing, as if he had not first been the disciple who longed for Jesus to show him how to follow. The Reverend Dave Davis of Nassau Presbyterian Church in Princeton, New Jersey, once proclaimed that we should instead call Thomas GPS Thomas. For when Jesus told Thomas to follow him, Thomas asked for directions. Lord, how can we follow you if we do not know the way? Minus those directions, Thomas leaves the safety of the locked room anyway, perhaps to gather supplies or to get a read on what the Roman officials were up to, or to see if it might be safe for the disciples to reemerge long enough to get out of town. Whatever the reason, when the other disciples encounter the Lord, risen yet wounded still, GPS Thomas is trying his best to proceed to the highlighted path, if only he can figure out how to get started. He's looking for a way forward, even amidst his own overwhelming fear and grief. And maybe that's it. Maybe his grief is what keeps him from believing the others when they exclaim, We have seen the Lord. For to lose Jesus once was pain enough. The invisible wounds, too fresh. If Thomas were to allow himself to believe that Jesus had been raised, to be disappointed a second time might have been too difficult a blow. Could Thomas bear being hurt again if the rumors about Jesus' resurrection turned out not to be true? When Jesus appears to Thomas, he invites Thomas to touch his visible wounds. I can't help but wonder about the invisible ones. Was Thomas hurt that Jesus first appeared to the others when he wasn't there to see? To the ones locked inside while Thomas had been the one to risk it all going outside on their behalf? Was Jesus disappointed that his friends had deserted him? Or sad that his visible, touchable wounds were necessary to validate his resurrection? The answer, of course, is, I don't know. It's all speculation to some extent, based on John's account, of course, but surely reading a bit between the lines. What I do know is this. It's that we come to God so very often through the eyes of Jesus' disciple, Thomas. He was the one who had not seen when the others had, and I think this is the very reason Jesus blessed him with the invitation to touch his wounds. Neither have we seen the resurrected Christ, at least not in the way the first disciples did. We come to God sincerely seeking some direction. We want to follow you, Jesus, if only you will show us the way. And when we ourselves become versions of GPS Thomas, we arrive at the seat of mercy in the presence of a God who cradles our doubts as if they were fragile eggs that only need the tending of a warm and welcoming presence to turn into faith. And as we come seeking this faith, wanting to proclaim with Thomas, my Lord and my God, Jesus' invitation to Thomas is also Jesus' invitation to us. And that is to reach out and to touch the wounds of the body of Christ. To put our own hearts and our own bodies in the places that are hurting in the world God loves. To see the wounds ourselves and to not look away. 
to not become desensitized. For the wounds we inflict on one another bear a striking resemblance to one another. The wounds currently bombed and shelled into the landscape and lives of Ukraine look so very much like the ones inflicted during the Armenian Genocide 107 years ago. The anniversary of the murder of 1,500,000 Armenians is today. It is an anniversary which marks what was for most of the world an invisible wound. Armenians, though, will continue to mark this day, this wound, this hurt that has for so long gone unseen. And they mark it because they want to call attention to the fact that history must not be allowed to repeat itself. Gohar Petrosian, a member of the Unified Young Armenians, says, Every year we relive what happened to our grandparents and our great-grandparents. It just shows that we are not allowed to stop, not stop for the fight of justice. As they organize a vigil in remembrance of the Armenians who died, Petrosian and his colleagues are touching the wounds of Christ. I've often wondered where Jesus' disciples went, where it was that they were huddled with the doors locked when he appeared among them. And though I'm not sure the scriptural warrant is entirely there, it makes sense that they'd have returned to the upper room where just days before Jesus had washed their feet where Jesus had fed the invisible wounds of their hunger and washed and dried all the microabrasions their feet had sustained, what with all the walking they did on dusty, sandy, rocky terrain. <coughs> Maybe there in that room, Jesus told Thomas to do the same thing, to reach out with his own hands to touch the wounds both visible and invisible, that he might truly believe in God's power to heal and redeem the world through love. It's interesting to me. We don't know if Thomas actually did it or not. Did he touch Jesus' wounds? Maybe. Maybe not. But it seems for all the world like wanting to, like reaching out toward Jesus, was enough. And this, my friends, is good news. Wishing we could take all the pain away, we will tend to God's people this Eastertide with their invisible wounds in our hearts and the words of Jesus ringing in our ears. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And we will aim to answer God's call to tend the wounds of the world. But the truth is that that job will always be too big for us alone, which is no excuse not to try. But in the trying, if we are looking in the right direction, if in trying to touch the wounds of the body of Christ we are reaching for Jesus, it will be enough. For it was never GPS Thomas, but always our wounded, risen Lord, who guides us to our destination. And when we arrive, may it be said, we have seen the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
friends, having heard, having heard the word of God, both God's promise and God's call, let us confess our faith, the church's faith, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for the great gift of being able to reach out to you in prayer. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, you invite us to draw close, to know you as our adoptive Father, and to bring you every joy and sorrow of our hearts and minds. First, we thank you for the privilege of belonging to you. And in this Easter season, we are filled with wonder at the promise of new life through Christ's resurrection. Hear us as in silence we bring you thanks and praise. We thank you that in faith, in baptism, and in the Lord's Supper, you make us one body, your church. Bring your church around the world to the unity you intend. Guide your church in its shared mission. Bless this congregation and guide us in our work along with our mission partners locally and around the world. Hear us as in silence we lift up our prayers for the church. We bring you our deep concerns for this world you love so much. Make us good stewards and help us find wise ways to deal with the dangers of global warming, the increase of severe weather and storms, the rising of sea levels, and the peril to your creatures living on land and sea and air. Hear us as in silence we lift our prayers for this earth. We call out to you for peace in a world full of conflict and for justice in a world that seems always to favor the self-seeking rich and powerful. We pray especially for those in Ukraine, but also for countless other countries in conflict. Bring justice and peace between nations, within nations, between races, classes, genders, and in our homes and our hearts. Hear us as in silence we lift up prayers for justice and for peace. We pray this day for our leaders and for the leaders of all nations. Bring truth and sanity to our divided political life that we may live as a healthy democracy with leaders wisely seeking truth, working for the well-being of all, and preserving the rights of the powerless. Bring to repentance those who would wage war and sow division. Hear us as in silence we lift our prayers for our leaders. O Lord, hear our prayer for those who are hungry, for the poor, and for all who are oppressed. Give compassion and wisdom to all who hold influence, that harsh structures may be changed, and new initiatives created, that all may have access to food, to health care, to housing, and to opportunities to thrive. Hear us as in silence we lift up our prayers for all who are in need.
Hear our prayers, dear Lord, for those we know and love, and to those known to you alone, who suffer with illnesses of body, mind, and spirit. Give courage and give healing, and restore them to the life for which you created them. Give compassion and wisdom to those who care for them. Hear us as in silence we lift up our prayers for the sick and the suffering. There is more to pray for than there is time to pray it. And so we summarize all our needs in the words of the prayer you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we bow in gratitude for your abundant love. You have bestowed upon us all that we have, and you have given us your very self in your Son, our Savior. In thanksgiving, we offer these gifts, and we dedicate them to your use, that the love of Christ may be proclaimed in this community and beyond. We pray in his name. Amen.
Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord by touching the wounds of the body of Christ. And as you know, as you go, know that the blessing of God goes with you. May God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love and with those whom only God loves this day and even for evermore. Amen.